Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh. Violence and conflict do not stop when the media attention shifts to a new war zone. Pakistan, which for the last several decades had lived under the delusion that it could dominate the mountains of Afghanistan and use it as its strategic backyard, is about to find out as to how flawed its geostrategic policies have been. As the proverb goes, a nation that sows the wind must be ready to reap the whirlwind. On the night of the 31st of December, when the rest of the world was busy celebrating the New Year's Eve, the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, more popularly known as the Pakistani Taliban, announced a parallel government. This was the direct challenge to Pakistan's sovereignty. A detailed list of ministers such as defence, judiciary, information, political affairs, education and even a fatwa issuing authority was announced as part of the cabinet. On the 29th of November, the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, remember, had unilaterally announced that it would no longer abide by the terms of a ceasefire with Islamabad. And what has followed since is one terror attack after another. The month of December has been deemed as the deadliest for the Pakistani security forces in over a decade. In the year 2022, an estimated 282 Pakistani security personnel were killed by suicide bombings, IED ambushes, raids on security posts, etc., mostly along the Afpak border. Pakistan's Interior Minister Rana Sanaullah has recognized the threat posed by the TTP. Sanaullah has now conceded that there will be no mixed messaging, no distinction between good and bad terrorists. Surely we will try, and we have been trying to bring them to the negotiating table for talks. But the condition, the very first condition, is that they have to surrender their arms and come under the purview of the law. Also, the number of terror activities last year was very large, which must be brought down to a minimum. What is interesting is that even the Americans have verbally backed the Pakistani position. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price has said that Pakistan has the right to defend itself from terrorism. The Pakistani people have suffered tremendously from terrorist attacks. attacks. Uh, Pakistan has uh, a right to defend itself uh, from terrorism. But make no mistake, the Pakistani Taliban is attached to the Afghan Taliban at the hip. The terror bases of the TTP are located not just in Pakistan, but also in Afghanistan. So does this now mean that Pakistan will carry out airstrikes to stamp out the TTP terror hideouts even in Afghanistan? Because if this is what it intends to do, then the Afghan Taliban has put out a pretty dire warning. This tweet by a Doha-based Taliban official called Ahmed Yasser reminds Pakistan of its abject surrender to India in the war of 1971. Pakistan, remember, lost half its territory. East Pakistan emerged as the new nation of Bangladesh, and over 93,000 Pakistani soldiers surrendered to India. This is an image that Pakistan has never really recovered from. What the Taliban is now threatening to do is to dismember Pakistan if it decides to bomb the TTP targets inside Afghanistan. Make no mistake, this is not a civil war within the confines of Pakistan. This is actually a war by proxy that is being waged by the Taliban against the Pakistani state. And this is a geostrategic irony unlike any other that you'd have heard in world politics. When the Soviets invaded into Afghanistan in 1979, the American CIA had poured weapons and other resources to back the Afghan Mujahideen. Pakistan's then president, General Ziaul Haq, who feared that the Soviets might invade into Balochistan, allied his nation very closely with the CIA against the Soviet presence. It was under General Ziaul Haq that Pakistan swung decisively in favor of a policy of radicalization. An estimated 90,000 Afghans including Mullah Umar, the founder of the Taliban, were trained by Pakistan's ISI during the 1980s. Pakistan believed that it could use the turmoil and instability of Afghanistan to its own advantage by backing a radical, 
hardline obscurantist group which had no vision of a modern world. When the Taliban was formally formed in 1994, Benazir Bhutto, the then Pakistani Prime Minister, called the Taliban her children. After the 9-11 terror attacks, when the United States went after the Taliban in a relentless campaign of bombing to smoke out the Taliban, as Donald Rumsfeld put it, Pakistan, under yet another military general, Parvez Musharraf, flouted George Bush's ultimatum, either you are with us or against us. And Parvez Musharraf decided to both run with the hares and also hunt with the hounds. In fact, Musharraf has gone on record to praise the Taliban and also the Haqqani network. Militancy, we have introduced the Soviets to the Soviets. We have trained the Taliban to train 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 the Taliban to Taliban would metamorphose in the decades to come. The genie of radicalization, once released from the bottle, is unlikely to go back. The Taliban is flush with the victory that it has won over the Americans. It no longer sees Pakistan and the ISI as its benefactor and tutor. The TTP stated objective is the destruction of the Pakistani state as it exists. The Talibs, that are the students of the ISI, are knocking on the gates of Pakistan to give an examination of the very lessons of insurgency that they learned from the Pakistani generals. This is Pakistan's war by a thousand cuts, and it will have to fight it at a time when its economy is in shambles, when the Americans have no initiative to assist them, when China, which is Pakistan's all-weather friend, views the Taliban favorably. The thorny plant of religious extremism which Islamabad watered in the graveyard of empires is now threatening to consume Pakistan. For the first time since the war began, the United States, France and Germany have now committed to sending armored vehicles to Ukraine. This is the modern Russian warship Admiral Gorshkov, equipped with the deadly Zircon cruise missiles, has been dispatched by Russia. But amidst all this, Ukraine in a missile strike has killed over 89 Russian conscripts in the city of Makivka. Now, Russia has blamed the use of cell phones by its soldiers for having given away their location, which resulted in the strike by Kiev. But what's the truth behind this? Our next report gets you the details. Vladimir Putin declared a unilateral ceasefire for a period of 36 hours on the occasion of Christmas for Orthodox Christians. On Russian state media, Putin was shown attending the Orthodox Church Christmas service by himself inside a Kremlin cathedral. But Ukraine has accused Russia of opening fire in several areas despite the ceasefire. An estimated 41% of people in Russia and over 66% of people in Ukraine adhere to Orthodox Christianity. But there is little cheer in the battlefield, even on the most holy day of the calendar. At least to have peace in Seoul, in the family and in the world. To have peace everywhere, because there's no peace anywhere now. We want it to stop so that we can live like we lived before. On the front lines, there is a lull in the intensity of the war, but the soldiers are alert. As in the bitter, biting cold, violence can erupt at any moment and death lurks in every corner. Taras, who is fighting on the front lines, wishes to go back home, but is quick to add that if he doesn't fight, there may be no home to go back to. Yes, the mood is there. We think about our families, about previous years when we celebrated Christmas at home with our families. Now, it is not possible. So I miss home a bit. But what can we do? We have to chase them away from our land and then we will be able to celebrate. On the 31st of December, Ukraine claimed that it had killed over 400 Russian soldiers in the city of Makivka in Donetsk. 
Russia validated Ukraine's claim of a strike, but disputed the number of soldiers killed. According to Moscow, Kiev struck a vocational college with six HIMAR rockets, which resulted in the death. Further, Russia has blamed the illegal use of cell phones by its conscripts within range of the Ukrainian weapons, despite this being banned. There have been other instances in this war where cell phone signals have been used to track and kill soldiers along the battle lines. But this is the first time where the death toll in a single incident is this large. Despite over 10 months of relentless fighting, the pace of war hasn't lessened. On the 4th of January, Russia dispatched its modern warship Admiral Gorshkov, equipped with the Zircon cruise missiles. While on the other hand, for the first time since the war began, the United States, France and Germany are sending armoured vehicles to the battlefield to help the Ukrainians. A step that the Kremlin has dubbed as a major escalation. Instead of freezing the battle lines, the winter has made the war much more cruel. And there is no sign yet of talks, settlement or peace. Mexico is in the midst of a narco war that has brought life to a standstill on its streets. Ovidio Guzman, the son of the jailed drug lord El Chapo, was nabbed by the Mexican authorities in the northwestern city of Culiacán and was immediately flown on a military plane. Guardia Nacional. In the early hours of 5th January this year, the Mexican Army and National Guard personnel, in coordination with the National Intelligence Center, the Attorney General's Office, and the Sinaloa Public Security Secretariat arrested Ovidio N., the alleged leader of the Los Menores faction of the Pacific Cartel. Nicknamed as the Maus, Ovidio is in fact considered a key player in the infamous Sinaloa Cartel. There was immediate pandemonium on the streets of Mexico. Furious gang members blocked 19 major roads, including the one leading to Culiacan's airport. Air Mexico confirmed that one of its passenger planes was hit by a bullet in the fuselage. Passengers were seen covering on the floor of the plane, although according to reports, no one was hurt. The unrest resulted in more than 100 flights getting cancelled at the three Sinaloa airports. Vehicles were set ablaze on the streets of Culiacan by the gang members. These violent scenes, in fact, brought back memories from 2019, when a video had been captured, albeit for a short period. He was eventually released in response to an all-out war that was waged by his cartel. Mexican President López Obrador has struggled to curtail the brutal violence that is plaguing Mexico since having assumed power in 2018. Mexico has registered more than 340,000 murders since the 2006 controversial decision of the government to deploy the army to fight the drug cartels. Most of these murders have been attributed to the violent drug cartels. So widespread is the violence that even prisons in Mexico are infested by drug lords who carry out their criminal activities from the confines of their VIP prison cells. On the 1st of January, Mexico witnessed one of its deadliest prison breaks in history. An estimated 10 security guards seven inmates and two other attackers were killed. The daring prison break was orchestrated by members of a gang called Law Mexicals to free their leader, El Nieto. In total, 30 inmates are said to have escaped from the prison. Our next report gets you more details. A gang of gunmen stormed a prison in the northern Mexican city of Ciudad Juarez. The attack happened during the busy visiting hours of Sunday morning when the relatives of the inmates had flocked to the state prison to wish their loved ones a happy new year. The gunmen are said to be members of the dreaded gang Los Mexicles. Adding to the chaos, some inmates even set fire to their mattresses to distract the guards. Buenos días a todas y a todos. Yesterday morning, some people on board armed vehicles arrived at the state prison, carrying firearms and shooting security guards at the entrance and later inside some dormitories, starting the prison break. 
The deadly prison break was orchestrated to free the leader of Los Mexicles, Ernesto Piñón de la Cruz, more popularly known as El Nieto. The audacious early morning prison break lasted for close to five hours before the security forces managed to bring the situation under control. We are used to it because they did these things many times before. By the way they shot at people, I got scared as they did so at point-blank range. And they shot at all the vehicles that were passing by. Civilians dressed up in black but were better armed than the police themselves. The police immediately began a hunt to track down the inmates who had escaped during the prison break. In the ensuing gunfight between the police and the criminal gang members, seven people, including two police personnel, were gunned down. The total number of fatalities linked to the prison break on the 1st of January has now risen to 26. The director of the Cerezo 3 prison has been dismissed. His possible role in the jailbreak is being investigated. The border city of Ciudad Juarez has witnessed years of violent clashes between security forces and rival Sinaloa and Juarez drug cartels. These brutal turf wars have led to the death of thousands over the past decade. Los Mexicles is believed to have links with the Sinaloa cartel, the largest and the most powerful narcotics cartel in the world. The sprawling Ciudad Juarez prison itself has seen multiple prison riots and prison breaks in recent years. In August 2022, hundreds of Mexican soldiers were sent to Juarez to control fighting between rival drug gangs inside the prison. The fighting spilled onto the streets and claimed 11 lives, mostly of civilians. Mexican detention centers, particularly those run by the state, suffer from chronic overcrowding and violence. In February 2022, the Mexican Human Rights Commission stated that more than 3,700 were detained in the Juarez prison, well above its maximum capacity of 3,135. The overcrowded prisons in Mexico often end up as venues for a showdown between rival drug cartels. Strange as it may sound, prisons are also a place from where drug cartels poach members of rival gangs, recruit criminals and even plan and mastermind their narcotics trade. Unless the Mexican government can urgently address the problem of overcrowding and corruption in its prisons, the violence and the endemic lawlessness inside the prisons is a problem that will not go away anytime soon. South Sudan is sending about 750 of its soldiers to crush the rebellion in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The South Sudanese contingent will be joining the Kenyan, Ugandan and the Burundi forces who are battling the marauding M23 rebels who have captured large swathes of territory. But how effective has the East African contingent been in quelling the violence? And why has this simmering conflict dragged on for so long that is now threatening to get worse in the coming days. Our next board gets you the details. A major crisis is brewing in Central Africa. Juba is gearing up to dispatch 750 soldiers to the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Hundreds of South Sudanese soldiers have undergone six months of grueling training as preparation for this operation. They will be joining the Kenyan and the Ugandan forces to fight against the Rwanda-backed M23 rebels. Since we became independent, this is the first mission for us to be part of in order to bring peace to the region and also the whole world. And that is very important because in our country here, we have peacekeepers to keep the peace for us. But now we are going to bring stability and peace and bring total peace to Congo and all our borders. M23 is a largely Congolese Tutsi militia who catapulted to prominence 10 years ago. When they captured Goma, the capital of North Kivu, in 2012 before being driven out. Kinshasa accuses its smaller neighbor Rwanda of backing the M23 rebels and fomenting trouble in its eastern provinces a charge refuted by Kigali. 
But the allegations are supported by Western powers, including the United States, France and Belgium, as well as the United Nations. A recent report by a group of UN experts found substantial evidence of a direct intervention of the Rwandan Defence Force in Congo. M23 has captured large parts of territory from the Congolese army and allied militias. Rwanda denies any involvement in the M23's resurgence. Nonetheless, the region appears to be veering towards a major diplomatic crisis. A breakthrough was achieved last month when, as a goodwill gesture, the M23 rebels began withdrawing from several regions they had captured in recent offensives. This is a goodwill gesture that the M23 will make today. It's in the name of peace and a gesture that is part of the recommendations of the mini-summit of heads of state held in Angola in November 2022. We hope that the Kinshasa government will seize this opportunity with two hands and work to bring peace to our country. In the name of peace, the rebels handed over positions they had occupied around Kibumba, some 20 kilometers north of Goma. The Congolese army, though, has dismissed the withdrawal as sham and designed to reinforce the rebel positions elsewhere. The Luanda ceasefire agreement also aimed to allow thousands of internally displaced people to return to their homes. An estimated 450,000 people have been forced to flee their homes since March last year when the offensive began. DRC ranks among the five poorest nations in the world. This long-standing violence and armed conflict needs to be resolved soon to prevent this humanitarian crisis from worsening any further. Thanks for watching World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, suggestions or feedback, please feel free to tweet to me on the Twitter handle that you see on your screens. I'm your host, Mohamed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.